program if you'd like to make note. On Thursday evening at 7 p.m. in the Bonner Room of the Student Union Building, there will be a simulation game that was produced by Ground Zero in Washington, D.C. The name of the game is Firebreak. Everyone present will have an opportunity to participate and make decisions over two world crises between the Soviet Union and the United States. We cordially invite you to be present and to participate in that game. It's based upon a game that was uh, produced also by the National Security Council. I think you'll enjoy it and will add much to the week. I would also like to announce that following today's speech at 2.30 p.m. in the Bonner Room of the Student Union Building, we will have our first of five response panels. We'll have one each day, and today it is at 2.30. We have a group of people on a panel that will do an excellent job, I'm sure, in responding to today's keynote address. Also today at 4 p.m., there will be a movie called A Guide to Armageddon, which is also in the Bonner Room of the Student Union Building. I would be remiss in my duties if I did not at this time recognize those who are responsible financially, not only for this symposium, but for many, many activities that have taken place on the popcorn forum and in the convocations. At this time, I would like to recognize and ask them to stand every member of the student government at North Idaho College, both this year and in the past. Some past members are here, too. And if you think these are worthwhile, let's give a very warm appreciation to all members of student government. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, it's a great and special privilege for me to introduce to you someone that I asked to be with us today, and that is the president of this institution. I can assure you that for many years he has been most active and in a very energetic way in all activities on this campus, be it music, debate, lecture series, athletics, our curriculum. He has particularly been very supportive of the lecture series and the TV productions, which he believes is part of the responsibility of an institution to bring people to our campus who are experts. He is a, the most dedicated person at this institution, working day and night. Let's give a warm welcome to your host today, the president of North Idaho College, Barry Schuler. Ladies and gentlemen, it's my pleasure to officially welcome you to the beginning of our week-long series in, in public forums and convocations on the topic of nuclear war, the dangers and realities. Obviously a very important topic for us today, very much a part of the concerns in the media that we're hearing, uh, part of the concerns in Europe, our allies, and all around the world. And certainly I'm pleased that we can be involved in finding out what this issue is about and what role that we should play as citizens of this free nation. I want to compliment North Idaho College and its convocation committee and Tony Stewart for the fine job that they have done in setting up another one of these very interesting uh, topical uh, forums for a week-long series. This is part of, as you know, of the enrichment of the college experience that you obtain here at North Idaho College, and we think it's a valuable adjunct to the classroom activities in which you participate. So we do welcome you here today and hope that you will attend as many of these uh, different programs this week as you possibly can, because I'm sure they're going to be worthwhile. We'd also like to thank Leona Hassan and the uh, Convocation Committee that she heads for their support of this effort, and, and of course, particularly Tony Stewart, who's done a lot of the work on getting everything lined up. It's my pleasure at this time to introduce the first speaker, who was commissioned as an ensign in April 1945, and then he became a naval aviator and was involved during the UN operations in Korea. He was transferred to the Pacific Fleet in 1965 where his assignments included command of the amphibious assault ship USS Ogden and the aircraft carrier USS Midway. He was promoted to Rear Admiral in 1972. Admiral, uh, he served in several positions, including uh, General Alexander Haig's staff in Europe from 77 to 79. His last assignment on active duty was in the Pentagon as Assistant Deputy Chief of Naval Operations for Plans, Policy, and Operations. In this capacity, he was engaged in the U.S. naval planning for conventional and nuclear warfare. During 37 years of service, our speaker was awarded the Defense Superior Service Medal, the Legion of Merit with three gold stars, the Bronze Star Medal with Combat V and Gold Star, and the Air Medal with 
four gold stars. He also indicated to me just a minute ago that he knew our Admiral from Coeur d'Alene, uh, Henry Glindeman. So with that, I'd like to welcome, as your first speaker today, Rear Admiral Eugene J. Carroll, Jr. Thank you, Mr. President. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. As I drove into the campus a few moments ago, I saw a marquee out there with my name on it. Thank you. And it said, nuclear war. <laughs> Believe me, I haven't brought one with me. I hope, hope to leave one here, but it reminds me of the <clears throat> remark that Paul Newman received. He's a good friend of the Center for Defense Information and works closely with us. And he had come to Washington to work at a conference on nuclear war, and a cab driver asked him why he was in Washington, and he said, oh, I'm here to talk about nuclear war. The cab driver said, oh, he said, are you for it or against it? Uh, we're going to talk about whether there is a, a side we should be on, and in talking about it and providing an overview of the state of the world today in terms of the danger of nuclear war, an assessment of the threat, uh, I will be speaking from a point of view, necessarily. I, no one person, no single organization can possibly be the seat of all knowledge and wisdom on a subject as complex as our national security, and certainly nuclear capabilities have a great role in that security. So let me tell you about my point of view. <clears throat> I am a military professional. I have served with Hank Glindeman a good many years in the United States Navy. I finished 37 years. Uh, during that time, I was intimately involved in many, many aspects of operations and planning and believe that I have a good sound view of military strategy, a graduate of both the Army and Navy War Colleges. Uh, I believe in national defense. I am not a pacifist in the sense that that I think we can make ourselves safe in the world by simply beating our swords into plowshares and pruning hooks. I know that we go can't expect that tomorrow or next year all the nuclear weapons are going to be gone. We've got to plan for our protection in a sound and sensible way in order to protect our citizens and our territory in a very difficult world, a very dangerous world. But being a professional military man and supporting a sound national defense in no way involves supporting every weapon that anybody can think of on the grounds that more weapons are always better. There are matters of priorities to be decided in the first place. We can't buy all the weapons. We have to select within our resources. And then we must select the right things that do add to our security, avoid waste and excesses, and above all, decrease the threat of nuclear war. And that's what I'm going to be talking about today. How do we live with this threat of nuclear war and what do we do that will help make us safer in the future? By the way, as we talk about nuclear weapons and nuclear war, there's a tendency of the mind to reject these very difficult ideas, these monstrous concepts. Nuclear war is very, very abstract, and it's easy to try to push it away. Well, I'm going to tell you that for me, it is not an abstraction. I've lived with it too long. In 1955, I started flying nuclear weapons and planning the destruction of actual wartime targets. And since that time, every year, I've sort of moved up in the, the hierarchy <clears throat> until finally, in the latter days of my career, I was dealing with our national plans for strategic war, the so-called Single Integrated Operational Plan, or PSYOP, which provides for the elimination of our adversaries. And for this reason, I'm vitally concerned with the fact that nuclear war is, is not an abstraction. It is a reality unless we do things very wisely. When I hear the President of the United States speaking to the British Parliament, as he did last year, and saying, we have a hope and a plan which will leave Marxism-Leninism on the ash heap of history. He is not speaking in abstract terms, speaking in very real terms, because we have a plan and a capability to do exactly that. 
What's wrong with that? The Soviets have a plan and a capability, and if it comes to ash heaps, there will be two ash heaps and probably no history. So we have to be very serious about this and talk about a growing problem, the risk of nuclear war. And the good news that I bring you, not too much of it, is that everybody recognizes the problem. Everybody recognizes that there are too many nuclear weapons and the risk of nuclear war is increasing. The bad news is that nobody really agrees on how to go about changing this, turning us away from this program which since 1945, before most of you were born, uh, found us with two nuclear weapons which we used in wartime and now finds us with about 50,000 nuclear weapons in the world today. The world has changed since 1945. President Reagan says our pressing requirement today is to reduce nuclear weapons to levels which no longer threaten the survival of both nations. Very wise words. The Soviet leaders echo those thoughts. Mr. Brezhnev and now Mr. Andropov have said over and over again very clearly that they would welcome reductions in arms and that they would participate in agreements to reduce the level of the threat. We understand the problem, we talk about the solutions, but we don't seem to get there. Right now, in the United States, our basic approach to the problem of how do we deal with these nuclear weapons is to achieve peace through strength. This is the stated policy and approach of President Reagan and his advisors, peace through strength. He has told the world that the United States will rebuild its strength which has fallen dangerously low. We have a defense program, and this is, this is in the budget of the United States, defense program which ensures our capability to respond to and if necessary fight successfully either conventional or nuclear war. That's a new development in this administration. The administration is seeking the ability to fight successfully a nuclear war. Not, not that they want to fight it, but we are actively pursuing the ability to fight it successfully, if need be. And we'll talk about the consequences of that policy. Mr. Weinberger has taken the directive from the president then to prepare to fight a successful nuclear war and has expanded it until the guidance to the armed services today is prepare to respond to the Soviet Union at every plausible level of nuclear war fighting in order to prevail in a protracted nuclear war. Now there is a very broad statement and if we try to think in terms of what do those words mean, prevail in nuclear war, we get into pretty gray areas. What's a protracted nuclear war? Anything longer than 30 minutes, two days, two weeks? It's a very fuzzy concept, but what it does is it justifies an almost endless investment in weapons. There is no weapon which a scientist can think of or an engineer can build which cannot be justified and made necessary by a doctrine of nuclear war fighting which has as its end goal the ability to prevail in protracted nuclear war. In order to achieve that goal, we must spend a lot of money and we must buy a lot of weapons because, the President says, we are inferior, we are weak, we are in a position of disadvantage to the Soviet Union and because, as the President has told us very strongly in the last two months, we must fear the Soviets. We must fear them. They are the source of all evil, an evil empire. We really are creating a climate in this United States of fearing the Soviet Union and preparing to fight a nuclear war in which we will triumph over them. This is a very, very important part of understanding what it is we're doing in the United States today in our weapons program, and that's why I've dwelt upon it. Let me go back and check the President's words. We must rebuild our strength which has fallen dangerously low. We are in a position of inferiority and disadvantage to the Soviets. I, I can go into as many of the numbers as you'd like in the discussion period, and I'm going to save a lot of time for you to ask questions and discuss this further, but I'll give you one 
very important statement about the relative strength of the United States and the Soviet Union. The Soviet Union has 20,000 nuclear weapons. 20,000. But the United States has almost 30,000. The Soviets' weapons are in forms that will reach the United States by long-range systems we call strategic systems, and about 7,500 or 7,800, someplace in that region, can reach the United States with their intercontinental ballistic missiles or their sea launched or their, their uh, bomber delivered. 75 to 7,800 weapons that they can deliver against us here in the United States. But the United States has weapons in various forms, both strategic and tactical, short-range systems, which because of their location can be delivered on targets in the Soviet Union, and that total is something over 12,000. 12,000 on Soviet targets. So it doesn't appear, really, if you just count numbers, that we're inferior. Quality has a lot to do with inferiority and superiority. The Soviet weapons are, by and large, larger than ours. They've had technological problems, and they follow along behind us in the development of their systems, and they compensate for their difficulties with bigger weapons, so that they probably have twice the explosive power, the total ability to blow things up, of, of the United States. On the other hand, the United States weapons, besides being more numerous, are more accurate and more reliable. We are superior technologically. So you could summon this up and say, well, the United States is more apt to hit a larger number of targets they aimed at in the Soviet Union, while the Soviet Union is more apt to blow bigger holes someplace in the United States. And that's rather a strange way of determining inferiority or superiority. So let's apply one more measure. Studies have shown, and as a matter of fact, we have computed that if we destroyed 400 targets in the Soviet Union, 400 selected targets in the Soviet Union, we would destroy 75% of their industrial capacity and kill one-third of their population, 50 to 75 million people promptly. Now that's defined as destroying the Soviet Union. 400 selected targets, and you will agree even if that is not total destruction, it's certainly going to spoil our whole day. <laughs> the Soviets obviously can spoil our day, week, and year. They have 75 to 7,800 weapons. 400 of them delivered on selected targets in the United States would wreck at least the same damage in our economy and society and to our population. So here we are, 400 against 400 will in effect destroy each nation, and we're talking about 7,800 against 12,000. So there's the real point of this, this comparison. Nobody can be inferior or superior in that circumstance. We're in a condition of nuclear parity. Each side can destroy the other. It doesn't make any difference who attacks and who retaliates. Both sides end up destroyed, and there's no superiority in being dead on either side. By the way, this is not my own evaluation or simply that of the Center for Defense Information, which I represent, but it's the evaluation of the senior military leaders of the United States today. General Vesey, who is now the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff and the senior military advisor to the President of the United States and to Mr. Weinberger, spoke uh, just a month ago on national television, a David Brinkley show, as a matter of fact, and said, the United States is not inferior to the Soviet Union. He told Congress exactly the same thing a few months before. He said, I would not trade the armed forces of the United States for the armed forces of the Soviet Union. Wouldn't trade jobs with their Minister of Defense. We are not inferior. Now, no one is going to come out and say we're superior because that would hurt the budget. But the fact is that we're not inferior by their own judgment. Last word on it, and this is one we really ought to pay attention to, uh, Secretary Weinberger, who is very much in favor of expanding our military forces, told Congress last year that he would not trade the U.S. 
nuclear arsenal for that of the Soviet Union because we have great technological superiority. So these, I think, are fairly objective statements of the fact we are not inferior, we are not in a position of disadvantage or inferiority to the Soviet Union. There is, of course, a purpose in frightening us and telling us that we are inferior. Here's a latest statement of it. This is a book published in Washington a month ago, by uh, last month, I should say, about six weeks ago, by Mr. Weinberger. It's called Soviet Military Power. And it's 107 pages in four colors of, of the danger of the Soviet Union, of their forces, their planes, their tanks, their missiles, ships. And if you read this just by itself, you would come out with the impression that the Soviets are really armed to the teeth and are prepared to, to annihilate us at the first opportunity. This happened to have been prepared and submitted just as the budget went to the Congress for $280.5 billion for our new military program. So there may be some relationship between claiming inferiority and pointing out these great risks and the budget request. Well, what are we paying out of this fear that the Soviets are going to attack us, that they're superior to us? I'm only going to very briefly bore you with the numbers because they're almost beyond comprehension, but I've got to give them to you. Mr. Reagan's first military budget, the one for which he was responsible uh, after assuming office, was the 1982 budget, and in that he asked and received almost dollar for dollar $219 billion. Has anybody got an idea what a billion dollars is? I, it's awfully hard to comprehend. Uh, I decided to get it down to thousands. What do you have here, at, uh, Nick? Uh, 2,000 students? About? Okay, if we can reckon in thousands, you can think of your student body and measure in those terms. Uh, $1,000 a day would be a pretty good salary. Anybody object to that salary? I'm going to hire you. And I'm going to have you work for me until you've earned a billion dollars, and then I'll give you a paycheck. That's bad news. You've got to earn the whole billion dollars at $1,000 a day. And it's going to take you 2,740 years before you get paid. Now, that's $1 billion, $1,000 a day, 2,740 years. And the first budget was, was $219 billion. The 1983 budget, the one we have today, is $245.5 billion. The budget which President Reagan submitted last month is for $280.5 billion. And then if you just go on ahead in his five-year plan, and by the way, he's obligated by law to tell the Congress the plan for five years of military expenditures in advance, it goes up to, uh, where were we, 280? It goes up to 330 billion. It goes up to 365 billion, bingo, $1 billion a day in 1986. It goes up to 400, 397 billion dollars in 87, and 433 billion dollars in 88. So if you add together this year's budget and the five-year plan, you come up with two trillion, fifty billion dollars, or a billion dollars a day for six years, because we're afraid of the Russians, because we're inferior, because we must rebuild our strength. I, I can't conceive of the amount of money, but I'll say this, that even at that monstrous level, if we need it, if it's necessary to defend this nation and the citizens and our, and our uh, territory and our interests, then we probably are going to have to afford it. But this is where the Center for Defense Information comes in. We start looking at what it is we're going to buy. What is it that will make us safer and will protect our territory and our lives? And we find that the biggest weakness in our military forces today is in the conventional forces, in, in the readiness of those uh, units, Army, Navy, and Air Force, Marine Corps, that we've already, in effect, bought and paid for, but aren't combat ready because of either low states of training or inadequate support, lack of spare parts, lack of, of uh, uh, reserve stores. President Reagan himself, when he came to office, said he was appalled at the low level of readiness of our forces for this reason. And yet the budget going up 30, 35 billion dollars a year each year doesn't provide any more readiness for the conventional forces. It just sort of puts patches on that problem. We're not making our 
Army units any stronger. Really, there's only about a 2 percent increase in the budget, although the budget itself goes up 15 percent almost each year. There's very little uh, new strength in the Navy or the Air Force. We, we really aren't building any greater capability where we are weakest. We're plowing it into new hardware, new machines, new weapons, and heavily into new nuclear systems. And this is the main point that needs to, to uh, be made here today, is that the fastest growing item in our national budget, of any place in our national budget, naturally it occurs in our military program because that's the fastest growing program, is procurement of new weapons. It goes up from $80 billion this year to $94 billion in 1984 to $125 billion in 1985. It's just going up astronomically for new hardware that really isn't going to work much better, if at all better, than what we have today. So there's the first thing that's wrong with the budget. The next thing that's wrong with the budget is, despite the fact we are at nuclear parity today, is that we're counting on building more than 17,000 new nuclear weapons and the delivery systems, which are all frightfully expensive. More than 17,000 more on top, well, we actually won't add them all. There'll be new ones and some of the old ones will come out at the bottom because in the first place we need the explosive material out of them to make the new ones. That's the other good news I have for you. There is a shortage of nuclear explosive material in the world today because we're both building weapons so fast we can't manufacture the explosive material that fast. We're going to be putting these 17,000 new explosives on the most dangerous weapons yet conceived. The MX missile, the Pershing II missile, the Trident II missile to go into our submarines. And these all together become part of a first strike nuclear system, one that will threaten the survival of the enemy's strategic forces, those that he thinks he needs to, to deter our attack. Today we can't attack their, first, their strategic forces with any confidence of success and they can't attack ours with confidence. But if we build all of these new first strike systems and the Russians keep pace as they will, very early in the future, we're each going to be moving forward under what's called a hair trigger of a first strike strategy. Hit the other man before he hits you in time of crisis. We're building a whole new family of weapons called cruise missiles. These are little pilotless airplanes, about 21 feet long, uh, very easy to conceal. In the nose of each one is a nuclear bomb, which is 15 times as powerful as the bomb which destroyed Hiroshima. And we're going to put 5,000 plus of these into our arsenal and absolutely envelop the Soviet Union in an entirely new dimension of nuclear threat. We're going to put them on mobile ground launchers, which are very hard to locate and, and uh, keep track of. We're going to put them on B-52 bombers, which are easier to keep track of, but there will be thousands of the weapons on B-52s. We're going to put them on our surface ships and we're going to put them on our submarines and just wrap them around the Soviet Union. And the Soviet Union is going to do the same thing. This book makes it very clear that they are already looking into the cruise missile program with a view toward matching our commitment. The last area that I'll mention particularly that we're building that is of great concern is a new family of battlefield weapons. We're building new artillery shells and new lance missile warheads. These are short range missiles on the battlefield using the neutron bomb or enhanced radiation technology. And this is the idea that you have a precise weapon which will destroy an exact enemy formation and minimize the damage elsewhere. And this encourages the belief that you can fight a very neat and tidy limited nuclear war on a battlefield. And that's a dangerous notion. We're going to equip and train and, and in time deploy our armed forces with these weapons and increase the probability that we'll have to resort to the use of them in time of conflict. General Bernard Rogers, who commands our forces in Europe today and, and where these battlefield systems are clearly intended to be used, told Congress last year that if I use those weapons on the limited battlefield, the conflict will escalate to the strategic level and very rapidly. 
The military commander says that it won't work, and yet we're building them as part of the 17,000 new weapon program. Once again, if this would make us safer, if somehow or other this would give us increased strength, which would enable us to threaten and control the activities and, and deny the Soviet Union any military threat, fine, build them if it makes you safer. But what's going to happen? The Soviet Union, just as Mr. Weinberger says, is going to keep pace, and all we're accomplishing in the process is going up and up and up this nuclear ladder, and we'll still be at parity. It's just the weapons will be more dangerous, more threatening, more destabilizing, and of course the level of ultimate destruction will go up. It will no longer be a question as to whether the United States and the Soviet Union survive. It will be a question as to whether this planet survives because we simply will reach some point in the explosive exchange where we'll probably do so much damage to the environment that the th life cycle on Earth is definitely uh, in jeopardy. Now, I can't go into the economic and political costs of this sort of a competition. Uh, I just want to point out to you that there are economic costs, and our economy is a great part of our strength. We can't go on running deficits of 180 to 200 billion dollars a year. We just can't do it. it. Our economy will not stand it. There are social costs. Some of you may be facing them already. The military budget in the 1984 submission goes up 35 billion dollars, and the social programs so-called income security programs go down $21 billion. There's $9 billion taken out of Social Security, $2 billion out of uh, unemployment compensation, $5 billion out of housing assistance, $1 billion and a half out of nutrition and, and uh, food supplements, money out of college student loan programs, and so on. So how much longer will the American public support a program which always gives increasing priority to the national military budget at the cost of the other things that our government does for the well-being of the people? Uh, I don't know. That's a judgment I can't make. The American public is going to be making it. But it's a very important cost of our military program, and I'm sure it will be considered. What then is the alternative to this rather drab or threatening picture that I've painted to you. One of both sides increasing expenditures and, and weapons, uh, increasing the risk of war. How do we get out of this cycle? And the answer I propose is not even an alternative. We don't have any choice any longer. We're going to have to go to some form of positive, effective arms control. Now, as I discuss arms control as a concept, please bear in mind I am not saying we simply get rid of our weapons and we throw ourselves on the face of uh, the, on the mercy of the opposition, or that we give up adding sensible capabilities to our national defense forces. No, I'm not saying either of those. What I am saying is that arms control limitations and reductions of weapons must play a part in maintaining the balance between the powers just as surely as increasing capabilities play a, a, a part in the balance. But there are many areas that I will suggest to you where we can reach these agreements to the mutual benefit of both sides and end up cutting some of these expenditures, end up reducing some of these risks. In order to make arms control effective, we have to reach a new view of arms control, and that is we must give up the idea that we can negotiate with the Soviet Union in which they are inferior and we are superior and that we will win the negotiations. Now that's exactly what we're doing today. The proposals we have on the table in Geneva, the intermediate range reductions and the strategic arms reductions proposals, require the Soviet Union to give up major elements of their nuclear arsenal, and we, at the same time, are entitled to add to ours. When you get to the bottom line on all of those proposals, that is the balance. And I'll, I'll give you a measure of that in just a moment. We cannot win negotiations. The other side will not come to the table to surrender. And that's what 
what it means. A winner, there must be a loser, and he has surrendered, and it isn't going to happen. The measurement that I'll give you is to tell you that if the Soviet Union walked into the room in Geneva today and signed both of those agreements exactly as the United States has written them, we, the United States, would not be barred from building a single one of the new 17,000 plus nuclear weapons in our program. That's how one-sided those proposals are, and that's why there is no basis for negotiation or agreement on the table in Geneva. It's simply a proposal for the U.S. to win the negotiations, and we aren't going to make any progress until we give it up. Well, what are some of the alternatives if we come to this idea that there are mutually beneficial agreements? The first one I'm going to suggest to you is a comprehensive test ban, an end to all nuclear explosive testing. We really have to take that as the first step to slow down the nuclear arms race. If you can't test, then you really can't develop new systems with confidence. So the test is the end, and, and uh, the beginning of the end. And uh, I think that we really ought to get down seriously to the business of, of reaching agreement. Uh, I have here a copy of a report filed with the United Nations by the United States, by the Soviet Union, by the United Kingdom. And this tells in detail all of the agreements we've reached in principle on a comprehensive test ban. And it really defines a complete end to all nuclear testing. You'd be surprised, I'm sure, to know that in here the Soviets have agreed to on-site inspection to verify a nuclear test ban. You'll hear over and over again the Soviets will never permit verification of these agreements. They have agreed in here in formal language to improve verification measures including on-site inspection. Why aren't we concluding the treaty? Why don't we have it today? This report was signed in July of 1980, almost three years ago. Why don't we? Because the United States, I regret to tell you, refuses to resume negotiations. All the other parties are willing, ready, and say that they will come to the table in good faith, but we will not agree to reopen negotiations and conclude that treaty. First step, and very important, uh, an analogous treaty that would be very achievable would be to end flight testing of new weapons. Uh, if you can't explode them or you can't deliver them, can't test the delivery systems, then you really have put a roadblock on, on new nuclear initiatives. There are other proposals which are equally attractive or, or suggest uh, possible agreements. Uh, some percentage reduction each year, with each side to decide what it is they'll reduce. It's just that each side has to reduce a certain percentage of their arsenal each year under international control. That would work. How about the proposal that we get down to single warhead weapons? You can build a new missile if you want, of any kind, but you can only put one warhead on it. And, and any new weapon will be a one warhead weapon. There are many tremendous advantages to that approach. Um, Se Senator Nunn of the Senate Armed Services Committee has a build down proposal. Build anything you want, but for every one you build, you gotta turn in two. Now, that's a possibly constructive way to get at it. We need, although this isn't directly related to nuclear weapons, we need a space treaty. We need to block weapons in space. Right now we have a treaty which blocks, let me give you the words, blocks nuclear weapons and all other weapons of mass destruction in orbit or on celestial bodies in space. And that treaty is being obeyed by both sides to the mutual benefit of both sides and the world. Now why couldn't that treaty be expanded to bar weapons of all type in space? It's very easy to verify would the Soviets agree to it? The Soviets have already submitted a draft treaty to the United Nations in which they propose banning all weapons from space. So it seems to be plenty of basis for optimism that we could go to the table and block weapons in space, and I think this would be a great step forward. The last one I'm going to mention here and save you some time is a mutual and verifiable nuclear freeze. Now, this is a movement in the states with which you're all familiar. You hear many objections to it. You hear many people arguing for it. Unfortunately, a great deal of the information you receive from both sides is a little off the point or, or misrepresents the facts. Uh, nowhere more clearly 
misrepresenting the facts in this publication here. This is put out by the U.S. Department of State, the nuclear freeze. And in here they have five reasons why a freeze won't work. If we had time, or if you want to go through them in the questions, we will. But all five of those reasons are wrong. Let me say about a nuclear freeze, it would be a very difficult agreement to reach. It would require the greatest of, of patience and, and of careful uh, consideration of the interests of the other side <clears throat> to hammer out the detailed language that would ne necessarily be required to have a mutual, that is binding both sides, verifiable, meaning each side will know the other one's abiding by it, end to the testing, production, and deployment of all new, new nuclear weapons and weapon systems. That's, that's what the freeze purports to be. And that would be a tough negotiation. <clears throat> For that reason, I suggest that perhaps the best strategy is to try to get the freeze a step at a time, to adopt some of these other measures that I told you about. <clears throat> a comprehensive test ban, an end to flight testing, an end to the deployment of new nuclear weapons, the things we can keep track of today very accurately, and then get down to the hard bargaining on some of the things that are going to be more complex and more difficult. But at least we could get started a step at a time. Let me conclude then by saying that we have to contemplate a world order, one that exists today, persisting into the future. It isn't going to change overnight. We are going to be in competition with the Soviet Union. Their leaders are very aggressive. <clears throat> they have objectives which are not entirely in harmony with ours, and they would not be unhappy if we suffered some problems along the way. But the fact is, we're going to have to find a way to compete in a constructive and confident way. And there's the important word I want to leave with you. Our policies must be based on confidence in our great strength in the fact that we are the most powerful nation on the face of the earth today in terms of our total national power, military forces, economic power, social structure, political system. There's no nation on earth that compares with when you combine all of those strengths, and we certainly ought to be able to use them in a constructive way in this world. In this world. I think that we have to adopt a whole new concept of our security a whole new way of making you safe, individually. And you know what it is? We've got to make the people just like you in the Soviet Union safe. We've left the day when we can be safer here because we have made the people in Russia less safe. In a world with 50,000 nuclear weapons <clears throat> in which each side can destroy the other, <clears throat> there is no safety for you if the other people are unsafe. We have truly become our brother's keepers in a world with nuclear weapons. And we... Thank you. It's easier to say that than it is to do it. It is particularly easier to say it as long as we keep pressing forward to create and intensify the fear. Somehow or other, we must recognize our strengths, gain our confidence, and proceed on that basis to find a way to stabilize this world order in which everybody can exist with some measure of confidence and, and security and dignity, and, and uh, there is no longer any way we can threaten our way to safety. Uh, having said that, I want to thank you and congratulate you for taking the time and the the commitment to come in here and hear this, to think about these hard thoughts, and to share with me some of the ideas that, that I've put forward. Uh, whether you adopt them or not, whether you accept my views, or whether you must dig for new ones, uh, gather more information, please don't leave the decisions, the final action on these ideas to the politicians or the infinite wisdom of admirals. We have had 38 years to work on this problem of nuclear weapons. We have 50,000 of them, and we're threatening to build more of them uh, at a record rate. So get involved, become good citizens, become active and concerned. Uh, whatever you decide to do, 
go forward uh, recognizing that it's part of your personal duty as a citizen in the United States to try to make this a safer and more peaceful world. Okay, they've turned it over to me, so I'm going to just recognize the first hand and we'll start the questions and discussion uh, with a hand over here. Your question, and probably others couldn't hear it, so I'll repeat it, is, is or are our economic considerations driving our military program? Are we trying to create jobs? Or are we genuinely, are our leaders genuinely afraid of the Soviets? It's a combination of both. Uh, the Soviet, I mean, the, uh, the present administration has many advisors who are very compatible and, and supportive of President Reagan's views. That's why they are his advisors. They've been chosen for their ability to take his concept of the world order in which the Soviets are the evil force threatening us and translate that into programs which will defeat that evil. Um, economic reasons also play a strong measure in driving that procurement account up. Remember I said the fastest growing thing is new weapons. That's the, fast, uh, that's the item of the military budget which produces the profits. There isn't a lot of profit in the other things we do in the military, but procurement of new weapons is a fabulously profitable process and does involve jobs. Uh, let me give you an aside. The administration and Senator John Tower of Texas particularly have been very quick to point out that we can't cut the defense budget this year because it will hurt our economy and will cost us jobs. At the same time, the Joint Chiefs of Staff in their annual report to the uh, Congress uh, said that we could tell the Soviets were up to no good because they had a chance to help their weak economy and improve the standard of living for their citizens by cutting defense spend expenditures. Uh, you can't have it both ways. If it's good for us, you can't blame the Russians for spending money for their economy. The fact is, it weakens our economy. The long-range effect of over-expenditures on military uh, systems hurt us, cost us jobs, cost us our position in world trade, uh, drive up interest rates, and are inflationary. So uh, we've somehow or other got to come to grips with the fact that military spending is not good for the economy. Down here. How do we verify, determine what the Soviets have and, and what are the technological uh, measurements? Um, let me see if I've got a thing here I do. As far as the numbers are concerned and the types, we get most of that information watching the testing process and then watching the deployments. Uh, if you're going to build something, you have to test it. We listen to, watch, measure the tests. We tell what that system is doing, and then we watch when it appears in the forces, and we count every one by photography, by electronic means, and other ways. So we have a very accurate measurement, which is reflected in here. This says what the Soviets have accurately. It just doesn't count any of their weaknesses or limitations. It just, and it also has big flaming arrows and things blowing up. Uh, <laughs> it's a fearful document, although the numbers are correct. Uh, now, on the level of our technology, here is a report by Mr. DeLauer, who is the Under Secretary of Defense for Research and Engineering, uh, in his uh, testimony in support of the budget. And he finds that in 20 areas of technology, 20 areas, the Soviet lead the United States in one, and that is the conventional uh, explosives. They have more different ways of packaging and exploding conventional explosives than we do. There are four areas in which the two are about equal, 
and there are therefore 15 areas in which the United States technology is superior. And once again, this is found through watching their tests, uh, through professional sources, through espionage, uh, listening to everything they say, photographing everything they do. And we do all of that every day. Yes, here in the center. No, I, I didn't say it would leave them inferior. I said if they accepted our proposal, they would be making all the concessions and we would go right on building. Okay. And my question is, uh, how would our government, the present government, respond to that, uh, that thought on your part? Uh, and what position the present administration really couldn't contradict my statement. Uh, no, I, honestly, when you look at the provisions that are on the table in Geneva, point by point, number by number, we can go on building every weapon in our building plan, even if the Soviets sign that agree those agreements. And, and that's a fact. I mean, it isn't even anything that's debatable. Uh, Oh, the Soviet proposals, of course, are much more favorable to their side. As a matter of fact, the only one that they have put forward so far uh, tends to ignore the fact, this is on the intermediate range system, tends to ignore the fact that their SS-20s have three warheads instead of one. They want to match missile for missile between east and west, which would leave them with a warhead advantage. So obviously their position on the table is favorable to their side. And as in all cases, negotiations mean finding the place in the middle where each side can come to some give and take. That is totally missing in Geneva. There has been absolutely no give or take. President Reagan's proposal last month, which he called a flexible proposal, is totally inflexible. It is the zero, zero option all over again, except partway along the scale to get there. Let me give you an example. Um, if the Soviets took the president's new proposal, and let's assume that the president had in mind 300 weapons. He said he wanted each side to have the same number of weapons, didn't he? Okay. If the Soviets took that proposal, they would have to eliminate 500 of their 600 missiles and 1,000 of their 1,300 warheads and destroy them, dismantle them. The United States would build and deploy two Europe, 300 new missiles, each with one warhead. And that would be the bargain as Mr. Reagan proposes it. Of course, we would also go ahead and build 260, no, 272 more missiles and keep them in the United States. We don't offer not to build ours. We require that they dismantle theirs. So there's a, another mal adjustment. And the last one is it still does not take into account the British missiles the French missiles or the Chinese missiles, all of which the Soviet Sea aimed at them. So the Soviets would end up, in effect, inferior to their enemies. And as a result, there's no way in the world they're going to end up agreeing to that, to that proposal. Yes, over here. Uh, the government put out a five year Yes. The, the reasons that they say it won't work? Yeah, uh, I can tell them to you from memory, but let me read them to you real quickly. The five objections they have is a freeze at existing levels would lock the United States and our allies into a position of military disadvantage and vulnerability. Well, I've spent a lot of your time here trying to argue that that is simply not true on the basis of fact, not slogans. This is a slogan. The facts are we are neither at a disadvantage nor are we inferior. Uh, a freeze is not good enough. Now here's one of these wonderful statements in which they say a freeze is not good enough. Uh, who said it was? The freeze resolution which is on the floor of the House of Representatives today and the one that was in most state legislatures and most ballots last year said the president to negotiate a mutual and verifiable agreement with the Russians to end the testing deployment, uh, testing production and deployment of nuclear weapons and delivery systems as a prelude 
two significant arms reductions in the existing arsenals. And this is just misstating what the freeze movement really is about. We've got to stop building new ones so we can get fixed in time and then start pulling down real numbers. The President's argument that he's proposing real reductions in Europe is inaccurate. He is not. He's proposing the Soviets reduce and we build. And this isn't going to work. And also in 1970s, we did exactly the same thing for 10 years. I'm not certainly blaming President Reagan for that, but we talked for 10 years with the Soviets, made nine agreements with them on arms control, and at the end of the 10 years, the United States had outbuilt the Soviets, and both of us had more than doubled the number of nuclear weapons we had aimed at the other. That's what happens when you talk and build at the same time. A freeze would make significant arms control more difficult. Uh, that's just false. A freeze is the most significant form of arms control anybody's ever proposed. It would be a difficult one, hard to negotiate, have to be very careful about the verification, but it can be done and it is really massive arms control. Then you're just talking about reducing the numbers of weapons between the two sides. A freeze would cast serious doubt on American leadership of the NATO alliance. This objection is more or less along the lines that the Europeans would be disappointed if we don't send those new weapons to Europe. <laughs> if you believe that, I'd like to talk to you about a bridge I own, and I've got a good deal on it. <laughs> a freeze on all testing, production, and deployment of nuclear weapons would include important elements that cannot be verified, and here we are back to the verification thing. Uh, Mr. William Colby, former director of the U.S. Central Intelligence Agency, testified to Congress last year in support of a nuclear freeze that we have today the ability to verify all significant elements of a nuclear freeze agreement, carefully negotiated nuclear freeze agreement. In addition, there is the fact that the Soviets have agreed in uh, other areas of discussion to improved measures of verification. So I say the evidence strongly supports verification of a freeze as a reasonable uh, proposition. But let me add one more thought. The President and his advisors have said that when we are strong enough, when we have rebuilt our strength, that we can then enter into a freeze as part of the reduction process. Now certainly he intends to verify that freeze when he does it later. If it can be verified then, why can't it be verified now? How will it be any easier then? In fact, it will be harder because the cruise missiles will be out of the nest, scattered all over the world like a covey of quail, and neither side can have any confidence as to how many or where the weapons are. And, and actually the freeze will become harder to negotiate and verify every month that goes by in some of these new programs. So those are the five reasons they give. And, I've rushed through them, but that's the basic objection I have. Back here. Yeah, we're seeing the destroy the Soviet Union right now. Why don't we just stop building and revitalize our economic Well, that's a yeah. That's a. a very clear statement of if we've got enough and we're going to have enough to destroy them, uh, why do we need any more? Why don't we just quit building and let them do what they want? Uh, there's a certain measure of truth in what you say, but from a political standpoint, I don't think it would fly one inch in this country. I have an awful time when I go around and talk to audiences and try to get them to understand that we are not in danger and that we can come to equal, mutual, verifiable agreements with the Soviet Union over time, which will make us safer. And, and that's a hard way to bring people uh, to think, uh, to go to them and say, well, we're safe and we're going to be safe because we can always blow up the Soviets, so we'll quit. I think the American public would vote that out, uh, vote against it in large numbers. And, and we were talking about political realities. Uh, Whatever we're proposing should be something that could be supported by the majority of people in the United States. Um, that's the way the system's going to have to change, is when the majority come out strongly in support of a change, and, and they wouldn't come out in support of this change you've proposed. 
Let's see, there was a hand over here I almost got a while back, so I'll take it and then come over here. The question is about President Reagan's uh, proposal in his March 31st speech to put together a defensive system, to hope for something better in the future than this uh, monstrous doctrine of uh, mutual assured destruction. Instead of placing our faith in our ability to destroy the enemy, he says, let's, let's create the ability to protect ourselves. Uh, you can't disagree with that idea. The idea is, is a very appealing one, and, and if it could be done, would probably be a sound approach. But in the first place, the president himself admits it's very risky and, and full of all sorts of problems, among others, that we'd have to break a very good arms control agreement with the Soviet Union against such systems. Uh, he says it'll take more than 20 years. It'll be next century before we have it. Well, in that period of time, Believe me, the opposition is going to figure out what we're doing because we've got to put it up there and test it, and they'll know how it works, and they'll know how to counter it. If they're afraid it will work and they can't counter it, they have 20 years to figure out lots of other ways to deliver nuclear weapons against the United States other than sending them via intercontinental ballistic missile. And, and if they have to do nothing more than put one in every bale of marijuana that comes into the United States, that's a lot of weapons in here. Uh, you know how big the smallest nuclear weapon is? It's about the size of a wastebasket. It weighs about 58 and a half pounds. One man picks it up, puts it on his back, carries it someplace, buries it in the ground, puts a detonator or a timer on it, and, and there is a nuclear explosion waiting to go off when it's needed. Uh, I, there's just really no way to protect ourselves against nuclear weapons with a single system that only protects against one mode of attack. Last point I'll make on it. Every one of those platforms that we're thinking about someday in the future would have to have certain characteristics. It'd have to have a power supply, independent power supply. It would have to have sensors to detect threats. It would have to have fire control systems to aim at, resolve the threat, and where to shoot the weapon. And then it has to have a weapon, whatever kind it turns out to be. And above all, it would have to have very good computers to integrate all four of these processes, power, detection, aim, and fire. Uh, since everything that goes into space has to be rocketed there and it costs a lot of money for every pound we kick into space, they will be very, very lightweight, miniaturized, fragile systems and very expensive. We're talking about hundreds of billions of dollars just in research and development and testing before we get the operational systems, which would cost no one knows how much. I'm now the enemy, and I've been watching you do this, and I know what you're up to, so I devised myself a 200-pound hand grenade, a big hand grenade, but a 200-pound hand grenade in simple terms. It has an electronic detonator on it. I rock it in into space, and I park it alongside of your space platform. And every platform you put up, I put a, a, a space mine with it, and it goes right around the world. And anytime I want, I push a button, and there's a whole bunch of puss and and your space platforms are gone, or, or inoperative. I perforated them with enough junk to, to wreck them. Uh, it's just an endless waste of money to try to put those systems out there. The ability to defeat them is guaranteed, and in the process, we will have violated some arms control agreements, which are very valuable, moving us the right way instead of the wrong way. And I can't speak strongly enough in favor of a space treaty to turn off this whole process. Let's see, there was a hand over here I promised to get. Okay, compare the conventional forces of the U.S. with the Soviet Union. Uh, the United States has a clear-cut advantage in naval forces, and for that reason, the Soviet Union cannot project its forces overseas. They have a strong continental defense or land mass defense force. 
But once you leave the shoreline and go up against the U.S. Navy and our allied navies, very important point, it isn't just the U.S. Navy they'd have to worry about, uh, and our submarines, uh, they are out of business. They cannot project their power overseas. So there the Navy definitely favors us. Overall, our Air Force is superior to the Soviet Air Force. There are some numerical differences uh, which favor them, but the quality of equipment and training by and large favors us. General Gabriel, who is the commander, uh, chief staff of the United States Air Force, just told Congress in his testimony this year that our Air Force was superior to the Soviet Air Force. Uh, on land forces, clearly the Soviets have an advantage. Numerically, they have a great advantage in tanks, artillery, mechanized vehicles, uh, a slight advantage in tactical close support aircraft, uh, so that if it came to a war between United States ground forces and Soviet ground forces, where the Soviet have lines of communication, we probably would be at a disadvantage. But the only place we are arming and training and, and prepared to fight the Soviet land forces is in Europe, in NATO. And there, joined with our NATO allies, that advantage disappears. Uh, I suppose everybody in this auditorium, with one exception, I don't know who that would be, would know that NATO has more ground forces in uniform in Europe today than the Warsaw Pact does. NATO spends more money on military forces than the Warsaw Pact. NATO has better technology, a better economy. NATO simply is a very strong military force, and the Soviets, with their Warsaw Pact allies, have no way in the world to have any confidence that they could attack NATO without suffering a defeat or, at best, not succeeding in their objectives. And the risks would be tremendous, absolutely tremendous. Yes? Uh, the question is, basically, do we trust the Russians? Aren't they just trying to lure us into some sort of... Yeah. Yeah. No. The, the Russians don't trust us any more than we trust them, and that isn't going to change very soon until we get off of this business where we can each destroy the other in 30 minutes and where we're haggling with each other trying to win negotiations. Here's a pretty good pamphlet put out. Uh, this is by the Physicians for Social Responsibility. Trust the Russians, question mark. And inside of it, they have all of the ways we keep track of the Russians, the satellites and the listening devices and so on. And the point is, there's no need to trust the Russians. We shouldn't fall into any trap of trusting them. We ought to negotiate verifiable agreements the Soviets have at least as good a record of complying with verifiable agreements as does the United States. Now, that's a matter of fact. Yep. Okay. Uh, I have one more question, and this hand has been waving back here. I, I, I don't know. Here in the... Okay. <laughs> Two questions.